Welcome to Write With Love. I'm your host, Sarah Williams, best-selling author, speaker, and creative entrepreneur. Each week, I chat to passionate and inspiring authors about their journey in creative writing. Some are traditionally published, some do it themselves. Everyone's journey is different, and everyone has something interesting to say. We all love love and love what we do. Today's show is brought to you by our amazing fans and supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to help support the show and get some awesome bonus episodes, go to patreon.com forward slash Sarah Williams author to learn more. Now here's today's show. G'day and welcome to Write With Love. Today on the show, I'm chatting to Tia Cooper. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. No worries. So I'd love if you can tell us about yourself and your writing journey so far. Um, uh, the, I now write for HarperCollins. Um, I started, I was a school teacher for 35 years and I woke up one morning and I thought I was actually playing principal in a small two teacher school. And I thought, I don't want to do this anymore. I so <laughs> don't want to do this. And I went into school and uh, said, I need to take some leave. And so I took some long service leave and I, I thought I had about seven months or something, but I'd forgotten to add in the school holidays. So it turned out that I had about 12 months on, on full pay. So I took it and I was, I decided to um, start playing around with some stories. I'd sort of toyed, well, I'd entered a competition with Mills and Boone back in the eighties and I'd won second prize, prize, which was a bottle of perfume. <laughs> um, and not a publishing contract, which is what I'd hoped for. Um, and it was something that had been hanging around in the back of my head. So I decided mm. I'd like to do it again. And I was wandering around the internet and I discovered a, a competition called New Voices, which was, again, was a Mills and Boone competition. And I knocked off three chapters to the start of the story without any plotting or any just in, nothing I just wrote it and put it in there um, it did nothing but I got some amazing feedback and from a lot of a lot of writers and a lot of very good writers actually they were they you know they were yeah it was excellent anyway so I, I went away and I uh, I rewrote I wrote that and finished it and I sent it to Mills and Boone mm -hmm. and I had no idea what I was doing. And they sent me um, a letter that said, unfortunately, um, we'll have to um, offer you an R&R. &R. Um, we would be interested in seeing some of your other work. Well, I had no idea what an R&R &R was. Yeah. So I uh, just went, oh, I'm all right then. I'll send it to somebody else. I didn't <laughs> realise that they wanted to see it rewritten. <laughs> it was as bad as that. Um, so I, I, I mucked around with it a bit more and then I sent it to a small publisher in Canada and um, they published it as an e-book. It was called Tree Change. Oh, wow. And that company subsequently went down the gurgler. Mm. Um, and then I fiddled around with a few more and, that, and Escape came on to, um, Escape Publishing came onto the scene. And by then I'd, I'd written my first historical, it was a, it's called Lily's Leap. And I subbed that to Escape and they published it, which was excellent. Um, and by then my 12 months long service leave was up and there was no way I was going back to work. So <laughs> I, I resigned. So I took my superannuation and ran yeah. and hoped that I could stretch it out until I earned some money <laughs> out of writing. And the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah, fantastic. So you've gotten into historical fiction um, for the last few years. How many books have you got out now in total? Good question. Um, <laughs> I, there, are th there are three with Escape, which are, are e-books only. Well, and they're also large print, but basically they're e-books. And then I pitched, um, <laughs> I wrote what was going to be another submission to Escape, and it was a 50,000 word book. And it was called The Horse Thief. Mm. And I sent it to one of the people that read them for me. And she said, uh, don't be ridiculous. Oh, no, it wasn't called The Horse Thief at that stage. I'm wrong. She said, don't be ridiculous. He would have been hung as a horse thief. <laughs> so I had to finish the story off. In actual fact, he wouldn't have been. They changed the law by then, but that was neither here nor there. But the story just sort of grew and grew and grew. 
And I pitched it, it was then about 90,000 words, and I pitched it to Sue Brockoff at the Sydney conference in 2000 and, I can't remember, 14, I think. Yeah. Or was it, two, yes, 2014. Yeah. And, um, and she, they took it. <laughs> and, and it's gone from there. And it actually sold very well. It, it took a lot. That's why I'm hesitating about the date because it took a it took a very long it was about eighteen months from the time I pitched it to the time it came out. Anyway, it came out in November two thousand and fifteen. So that was the first one. I've been writing for them ever since. Yeah, fantastic. So you like historical fiction? You're not going to go back to contemporary or anything like that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're breaking up a bit. Uh, you um you you like the historical fiction uh, rather than the contemporary? Yes. Mm. I'd much prefer to write historical fiction and where I live is a very old historical village that time has sort of forgotten. So it, I've set all the books in the area around here and it just seems to be right. Yeah. <laughs> I enjoy writing I'm, I'm historical. I'm not yeah. historical. <laughs> I don't want to do any of these contemporary girls. <laughs> Fantastic. So I'd love to talk to you about the currency lass um, because I know we were both and a few other people we know attending the Romance Writers of New Zealand conference last year, uh, 2018 in uh, Auckland. Um, and you won two Coro awards and the Coro is um, like the equivalent of the Rita and, you know, for New Zealand or the, the Ruby for Australia. <laughs> so tell us about the currency lass, a bit of the, the story behind it. The story behind the currency lass. Um, well, I've always had a thing about circuses. And I spend a lot of my time, well, not a lot of my time, but the highlight of my life is when I sort of find these strange, random historical facts that I can turn into a story, I guess. <laughs> and I discovered that there was, a, there was a circus, and I think it was the 1850s, it's been a little while mm. since I wrote the book, um, that had travelled from Sydney to Maitland, which is the biggest town close to where I live. And... Um, and it had got to Maitland and it wanted to, and it had discovered that everybody had gone, they'd all gone to the goldfield, so they hadn't got an audience. So they, they packed up the circus and went across, across country to um, Safala, which is sort of near Mudgee in New South yeah. Wales, and um, set up their circus there. So I used that as the basis for the story, I guess. Excellent. And that's how that came about. So it tells the story. I've got to read it from the blurb because it's so long since I... <laughs> Read it. I've completely forgotten. Um, oh, yes, that's right. It's about Catherine. And she thinks she's going to inherit her father's property in the Hunter Valley. But um, he's trying to push her into a marriage to a particularly nasty, evil man called Bartholomew. And um, she doesn't want to marry him. She seriously doesn't want to marry him. So she does what every girl would do and runs away with the circus. <laughs> and... Um, and then finds out that he really had an ulterior motive and uh, and she falls madly and passionately in love with the lead performer who's a, well, he comes from Tasmania actually, um, but he's of Russian background. So you have to imagine him as a sort of Russian Cossack. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the story. Lovely. And very, would you very much, very much. Yeah, oh. we do love the love stories. Um, for the people lucky enough to be watching on YouTube, can you show us the cover? Oh, yes. <laughs> now, you've got to tell me if I'm going. Okay. Am I holding it correctly? Yes, that's beautiful. Yes. So I, I do. I see this book around a lot and I've got it and I've read it and it is gorgeous. So, yeah, the currents of this. Brilliant. So, yeah, you won two Coro Awards. So you won, um, what was it? The best book of 2000? I, I won the, oh dear, I won, I won the overall one and I, mm. I, I think it was the long romance or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, so you won your category. I'm not in the study, so I can't <laughs> Fantastic. And then you wrote, um, what came next? Because you're kind of a one book a year kind of published. Um, yeah, well, in actual fact, the currency, so The Horse Thief came out, mm. the one that I pitched to Brockhoff, and then and it sold quite well. And so they fast-tracked the next one, which was called The Cedar Cutter. Mm -hmm. And that, and then the currency last came out in the f in February two thousand and seventeen, 
And then The Naturalist Daughter came out in December 2017. So I've sort of, and now it's become once a year. Um, The books have sort of got bigger and more complicated and a bit fatter and dual timelines (laughs) and quite a lot more history in it. And the research takes quite a long time. Yeah, I bet it would. (laughs) And a little less romance. We're more historical fiction now rather than like historical romance. Yes, it's definitely... there is, I mean, there is romance in life, but the mm. stories for The Naturalist Daughter and The Woman in the Green Dress don't revolve around a romance. There's more to the story. The romance is more incidental, yes. whereas The Currency Lass is the story is romance. Yeah. So I mean, there's, a, there's more to the story than that. But. <laughs> That's it. So we may not get a happily ever after from these later novels. May not. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, you're breaking up again. Yeah, we we may not get a happy ending with the um the later lo- novels, the happily ever after. Sorry. <laughs> oh well, no, there there's definitely a happy ever happily ever after, but yeah. it's more implied, and because of the dual timeline, mm-hmm. um, it's the happy. Yeah, you have to have the happy ever after in the dual timeline in the earlier timeline for the rest of the story to work out. Okay. Awesome. I I like it. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) So So it's there, it's there, but it's not, it's not, it's integral to the story, but it is not the story. That's That's the difference. I think that's it. Awesome. Oh, that's brilliant. So, um, the woman in the green, green dress, (laughs) that's your latest book to Mm -hmm. have come out. So, um, it's only been out quite recent, hasn't it? Just a couple of months. It came out on the, it, it was in the shops on the 17th of December. Um, the official date is the 1st of January this year. Yeah, fantastic. So and you've got that cover? We're up to four months. <laughs> and you've got I've that got cover? that cover. Da-da. And it's a woman wearing yeah. a green dress. <laughs> there she is. But yes. you, have to see the back of the, you have to see the back of this one because they're doing beautiful backs on my ah. books now. So see with the that is extra pretty. bit. Yes, yes I love Which that. I really like. And, and then you have to look at the spine because it's supposed to look like an old book, you see. Uh, Can I show yes. you? I'll show you this one as well. You yes. see, they're old books, uh, which yes. is really nice. They are. That is very And that cool. one has a pretty back as well. <laughs> yes, I like that. <laughs> I, don't know what they're going to do. I don't know what they're going to do with the next one. It'll be interesting yeah. to see. <laughs> so the woman in the green dress, tell us a little bit about that. Well, the woman in the green dress <sighs> tells the story of, of two women. Um, f- um, an English woman called Fleur Richards and Della Atterton, um, who's an Aus- well, she is of English stock, but she's uh, she's living in Australia, and their lives are linked by a mystery surrounding the first opal that was found in Australia. Oh wow! That's about it. That's, it. <laughs> That's all you're going to tell us. So, so it's a dual, dual timeline book. And um, so Della's story is set in 1853 um, in the region around where I live, in a place called Mogo Creek, and in um, the Hawkesbury area has a fair amount to do with it. Mm. And um, Fleur's story begins on Armistice Day in London. Um, on the 11th of November 1918 yeah, yeah. and she finds herself traveling her husband has been killed um, and she finds he was a, he was an Australian soldier mm-hmm. and she finds herself traveling to Australia to sort out what she thinks is his will which she doesn't believe she's entitled to oh. in fact she's rather hoping he's still alive and that's as far as I'm going. Yeah. Oh, excellent. <laughs> a little bit of mystery. Can't stories away. No, you can't. <laughs> oh, fantastic. And she discovers all, all sorts of things yes. about what has gone on in the past. Yeah. It must be so much fun being able to dig into the past and, you know, not necessarily doing everything historically accurate, you know, down to that detail on that person and being able to um, weave stories in. I, I really do try my very hardest to mm. have it as accurate as possible yeah. and I always make sure there's a historical note at the end. I like to say that my stories are feasible. The characters are all fictitious yeah. or, the, or the, the major characters are fictitious but they yeah. revolve around the existing 
you know, governors of the day and things like that. Yeah. Um, I always try and find, it's, I mean, it's fairly easy to do where I live. I find their house because there are so many old houses here that were, you know, that are still in existence that were around then. Um, and this one's quite interesting because there was a man called um, Baron von Hugel, who was an Austrian. And he came to Australia. It was, it was very sad, actually. It was a broken love affair. So he ran away. His best friend nicked off with his wife, uh, with his girlfriend and fiance, in fact. And he drowned his sorrows by coming to Australia. <laughs> and he actually travelled through the Hunter area, which is where I live, in mm -hmm. 18... 32 I think it was and when I was uh, his journals which are held by the Mitchell Library have, have been were translated in 1990 into English because obviously he, he was an Austrian so they weren't mm -hmm. in English mm -hmm. and I found in the um, in the introduction that nobody actually and this is my favorite bit that nobody actually knows who it was who translated his his journals so it's an unknown amnuensis which is a ghostwriter yeah. and so the may one of the major characters in the woman in the green dress is the fictitious unknown ghostwriter oh that's so cool so he um so yeah so so historically it's pretty accurate yeah. but i'm filling in gaps yeah um, so so <laughs> the highlight of my life is when i find something you know on trove that says an unknown woman <laughs> <laughs> and then there's usually about three or four other facts that happen so with the woman in the, the green dress it's also about the first opal that was mm. found in australia and there was an it just so happened that there was another guy who was actually i think he was german um and he was employed by the South Australian Mining Company um, in the 1850s. Um, and he found, he is credited with finding the first, or being the first European to find, not, I mean, obviously, you know, yeah. the indigenous people knew that there were opals around, but he was the first, um, well, they didn't call them opals either. Um, he was the first um, European to be credited with finding an opal, but nobody knows what happened to that opal. It yeah. was never found. Oh. And so I took that opal and threw that into the story as well with the ghost rider. So we had a ghost writer and we had the missing opal. And then uh, I've had this thing for ages about um, women in business in the 19th century. And there were two women um, in Sydney at in the second half of the 19th century who ran a taxidermy shop. They were called Toast and Rohu, a mother and daughter. And so I stole, sort of stole their, their shop, if you like. And they <laughs> used to sell native, native implements and um, stuffed Australian animals and wombat muffs and yeah. kangaroo slippers and things <laughs> like that. So that all comes. So those, I, I wound those three, three, three facts, which are all all facts yeah and filled in the gaps and created the story out of it so that yeah it's pretty accurate actually, yeah oh, that's so cool. just characters yeah oh yeah. fantastic so we we definitely should keep an eye out for the woman in the green dress so that's in australia still in print um ebooks it, oh always. yes it's absolutely yep. it's absolutely still in print um yep. it's i believe it will be going to be format at the end of the year awesome. but it's up to it's i think it's in its third or fourth printing um yeah. this, at the moment and it's also da, 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 <laughs> available <laughs> in audio god love the audio <laughs> Oh, I can't listen to it. <laughs> yeah, apparently it's brilliant. I listened to the, the first chapter, but that's all. It just I find it very difficult. Are you, are you very just sick of it? Are you just sick of the work. story by now? <laughs> no. Oh, well, I, yes, I'm sick of it. I mean, I've done so many library talks and things, yeah. but no, I don't know. There's something very strange about listening to somebody. Um, the woman who's done it's done a brilliant job. Yeah. She's actually quite a well-known actress, Kathy Wisshus. Um, but there's something very strange about listening to the story that you've written coming out of somebody else's mouth. It's just, yeah, I find it difficult. <laughs> but I have it on very good authority that, that the audio version is very good and, and it's available as an ebook. Yeah. As well. Excellent. Brilliant. And so, saying, um, yeah. Yeah. So what are you working on at the moment? Um, well, I have my next book, which is 
I think the title's going to stick. It's called The Girl in the Painting, and that will come out just in time for Christmas this year, um, providing I get through the structural edits, which have just landed. Um, so that's in the can, yes. and I'm working on that. And at the same time, I'm also working on the one which will come out the following year. Yeah. I'm about 50,000 words into that. It's called The Cartographer's Secret. Oh, cool. Wow. And so lots going um, on. That, Oh, yes, lots going on. Yes, lots going on. And, yes, and there's another one that I'm fiddling around with which might, will come after that. But it's sort of, you have everything in different stages all the way along. Yeah, you do, for sure. Oh, that was fantastic. Where can we find you online and keep up with everything you're doing? Just a website address. I've got a website, which is tiacooperauthor.com. Um, and you'll find me on Facebook. I've got a, an author page, Tia Cooper Author, again. Yep. Um, and I'm on Instagram and Twitter, but I'm not terribly good at them, so it's yeah. probably a bit of a waste of time. <laughs> That's it. All the links are on your website, though, yeah. so we can keep up with you. And I presume you've got a newsletter we can join, and and that sort of. Oh yes, stuff. there's a newsletter on yes yeah. newsletter on there. There's a contact page with all the stuff. And if anybody has any trouble picking up print copies of the books, I do have a few, but not very many. Um, yeah. The currency lass and the cedar cutter are getting a bit hard to track down at the moment, but I believe they're going to be format as well. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. So. I love how they're doing big format nowadays. Well, that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for talking to me, Tia. I really appreciate it. It was great. Thank you. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed the show. Jump onto my website, sarahwilliamsauthor.com and join my mailing list to receive a free preview of my books and lots of other inspiration. If you like the show and want it to continue, you can become a sponsor for just a couple of dollars a month. Go to patreon.com forward slash sarahwilliamsauthor and remember to follow me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and leave a review of the podcast. I'll be back next week with another loved up episode. Bye.